so John 16, I know you guys have been going over this. Uh, John 16 is one of the shorter chapters in John's Gospel. Uh, not one of the more action-packed chapters, but there are some really important things that Jesus is saying. Remember, these are Jesus' final discourses, okay? So just to kind of reset the table for everybody and make sure you know that basically all of, uh, all of these chapters here that we've been studying over the last several weeks are all on the same night. This is all one night that these things are happening. Chapter 17 is just a continuation of the same night. This is... Uh, Maundy Thursday night. So it starts back in chapter 13. Uh, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. John doesn't tell us about the Eucharist. He tells us about the foot washing. But we know both of these things happen during the same meal. Uh, 14, they start moving. Where they move to, we're not quite sure. But at the end of 13, Jesus says, let's get up. Let's get going. Uh, we know that the end result is in 17, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we think this might be kind of a walk and talk type scenario. We're not sure. Maybe there's stopping points along the way. Uh, we know that uh, if you had a map in one of your recent, maybe it was last week's or two weeks ago, kind of of Jerusalem, but from where, uh, from where the upper room is to where the Garden of Gethsemane is, you got to walk by the temple. So uh, something important to know about I am the vine and you are the branches, uh, which was you know the previous one, I know you guys started, is, is that uh, it's likely that Jesus is giving this teaching in proximity to the temple. Maybe he's on the temple mount. Maybe he's walking next to the temple. The reason it's likely is because one of the big dominant decorations on the temple is this big, giant grapevine, a gold-plated grapevine that's coming off of the Holy of Holies, and it's stretching all across the Temple Mount. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of feet long. The grapevine is the image for Israel. And so when Jesus is saying, I am the vine and you are the branches, what he's saying is he is the new Israel. He is the fulfillment. Uh, remember, Israel is the name that God gives to Jacob, right? So one of the patriarchs. And that patriarch and his 12 sons form the identity of this community. And what we're seeing is that Jesus, the new Israel, and his 12 sons form the identity of the new covenant community. Okay? It's important that there are 12 apostles. Not 11, not 13. The reason that there's 12 and the reason that it's really important that Judas gets replaced by Matthias right before the day of Pentecost is that it's the new Israel and his 12 sons who form the basis of the new covenant community. I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. And he's using a big visual image right there on the temple to teach that. So they're walking along and then we're not exactly sure why, but Jesus transitions off of this image of the vine and the branches, and he promises a, a couple of different things. As And again, this is kind of a parting words, last words, however you might want to, to say that. Okay, uh, John 15 ends in the same place where John 16 starts. Uh, John 15 ends with some discussion about, about you're going to get hated. Uh, there's going to be haters out there, and all Christians are going to be hated. And why are Christians hated? Jesus is really clear about this. Uh, they're going to hate you because they hated me. Now, when we, when we say that, what do we mean by that? Let me use my slide that I made. Uh, yeah, so the world will hate you. Uh, the world's going to hate you because it hated him. And what this means is that Jesus doesn't have the same values that the world around him has. I think that's the story of the gospel, right? The story of a real conflict of values and priorities coming onto the scene. Jesus has come, remember, uh, to clarify, uh, to open, to communicate all of God's truth. He is the perfect revelation of God the Father, we say. 
That's what he's come to do, to embody that, to live a life that shows that, and to communicate it in word. So in word and in deed, Jesus shows us all that God has to say and all that God wants to tell us. Uh, but it's clear that the people around him are constantly at him and constantly disagreeing with him. He doesn't have the same values as the world. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples on this Thursday night, before he dies the next day, is the world's not going to like what you have to say either because you're not going to have the same values that the world has. Right? The world's values are always changing. I mean, I don't think I probably need to illustrate that statement because uh, I think you all can observe that pretty quickly and easily. The world's values are always changing, but there, there's always going to be this uh, juxtaposition between the world's values uh, and, and what we might want to call uh, heavenly values or heavenly realities. And so there's always going to be this conflict and the world is always going to ask Christian people to compromise on some of their values. And when you won't compromise on those, the world will not like that's what Jesus is saying here, right? So uh, materialism. Materialism is obviously, you know, rampant in our own culture. Uh, buy more stuff and you will be happier. And we are barraged with that message from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. And every, every show we watch and every Facebook feed we look at, everything else, it's all brought to us by advertising. Buy this and your life will be better. And if you believe that that's true, you know, you can just cite the, the statistic that, you know, depression is the most widespread disease in the world today. We've never had more material wealth, and yet we have tons of depression in our country. We have an opioid epidemic that's happening. We have tons and tons of people who are living their lives in absolute desperation. And they got, and they're buying more stuff on, you know, Buy, buy with uh, one click on your iPhone. I mean, I can just sit here and shop while I'm talking to you. It's so easy, you know? So we know that, that that's just one example, right? That we know that this is not the kind of thing that's going to bring any type of fulfillment. This is a conflict with the world. And when we say no, what we need to know is that the world is very powerful. Uh, and we're gonna, we see some demonstrations of the world's power in the Gospels. Uh, but we continue to see it. So the world's going to hate every generation of Christians when the Christian says, well, it's this, it's not this. It really is this. God really has told us that this is the way to live our lives. So the world is always sort of meddling and trying to grasp and to grope for meaning. Uh, and and for, for all of the... Uh, of the grasping and groping, what we know is that the world continues to look in the wrong places. So this is one of the reasons that Christ has come, right? To open the eyes of the blind. Yeah. And he tells them, hey, you're going to be hated. So here at the beginning of chapter 16, he gives them a really specific way that they're going to be hated. They're going to kick you out of the synagogue. You know, your church that you go to, they're going to kick you out. It's a painful uh, thing to hear, right? It's a painful thing that maybe some people who go to church here someday might have to hear, right? Uh, uh, they're going to kick you out of it, and what they're going to do is they're going to kill you, and by and there are going to be people that will think that by doing so they're offering worship to God. I mean, this is a kind of a bone chilling promise of persecution, right? That people will act in the name of God to kill other people. Now, we see lots of examples of that in human history. We see it from Christian people who are out killing other people in the name of God. Uh, we see it in other faiths, too. Uh, so it's not just us. There are many people. But uh, uh, this type of violence against his disciples, they're going to kick you out of your church, and they're going to kill you, and they're going to think they're doing a great thing by doing it. It's a bone-chilling reminder. It's one that ought to resonate a little bit with us. Uh, thankfully, nobody's, I don't think, going to kill us. We'll see about that. I hope not. Uh, but there's persecution that's on the way. All right? That's the first promise of chapter 16. 
The persecution's on the way. So when you hear a version of the gospel that goes something like this, if you only believe in Jesus, everything in your life is going to be great. If you only believe enough and worship enough and have the right attitude enough, God's going to bless you beyond your tremendous materially. He's going to give you this brand new everything. You're going to get, you know, this is not the gospel of Jesus. This type of prosperity gospel, which is rampant in our country today and is sadly growing massively on the continent of Africa uh, and throughout the world, this is not the gospel because they're in the real gospel, the one that comes from the Lord himself. He continues to promise there's going to be hardships, there's going to be persecutions, there's going to be difficulties. Now he's going to get to well, what's going to happen with that. It's not just going to be all bad, but uh, this is not all green lights, right? It's not all like uh, roses. There are some thorns along the way, all right? The, first, the next promise is the promise of the Holy Spirit. So you're going to have some hard times. There's going to be some rough waters ahead. But don't worry, because you're not going to be left hanging out to dry. All right? That's what Jesus says here. Uh, help's on the way, and help is the best type of help of all, is God himself. Uh, Jesus promises that there will be, uh, when he says that uh, uh, there will be the Holy Spirit will come to you, uh, he, one of the words he uses to describe the Holy Spirit is an advocate. You think about in a, in a legal context, uh, what does an advocate do? Somebody help me out with that. Speaks up. They speak up for somebody else. And it's usually somebody who's in a position of authority or a position of expertise who's speaking up on behalf of someone else, right? They're going to advocate for them in, in sort of a formal sense. Uh, this can be a, a lawyer, or it can be somebody who's assigned to protect uh, or, or advocate for uh, a child, uh, for instance, maybe, who's, who's been hurt or abused. Uh, so the advocate is someone who comes and who acts on behalf of somebody who's vulnerable. And what Jesus is saying is, Listen, this persecution is coming. You're all going to be vulnerable, but don't worry. You're going to have an advocate. God himself is going to be advocating for you. God himself is going to work within you. We know that Jesus' promise is fulfilled uh, seven weeks later on the day of Pentecost uh, with the giving of the Holy Spirit. As I said a minute ago, Jesus and his 12 sons, uh, his 12 apostles, uh, are blessed on the day of Pentecost, and the blessing is the presence of uh, God himself. Jesus keeps his promise. And so we have this Holy Spirit within us and within the body to dwell with us forever. Jesus talks about the work of the Holy Spirit here in chapter 16. And here's what he has to say. When he comes, this is the Holy Spirit, uh, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. And so what we want to say is one of the places that the Holy Spirit is extremely active is helping us to discern between right and wrong, because sin and righteousness and judgment are all a part of this difficulty that you and I go through every day, right? Every day we're, we're, we're <laughs> uh, vulnerable uh, to, to behave uh, in all kinds of ways. We can easily convince ourselves we're extremely good at convincing ourselves and justifying actions that, that maybe in our better moments we know aren't right. You know, I can say something bad about this person, you know, behind their back, well, because they're a really bad person, you know, or because they said something bad about me, you know, or whatever it is, right? We can convince ourselves very quickly to go down the path of sin. We are susceptible 
for all kinds of temptations. This is one of these battles between the world and the follower of Christ that happens in a very quiet way, in all kinds of corners of the world every single day. And it happens in your life, it happens in my life every day. We face temptation. What Jesus is saying is the Holy Spirit will come, and one of the ways he's going to advocate for you, he's going to help you with that. All right? And so what we want to say is that uh, the conscience of the Christian is one of these uh, ways that the Holy Spirit comes to us and advocates for us. When we talk about the conscience, we're talking about kind of the inner core of the human being. And a well-formed conscience is really, really important in the moral life uh, because it guides us towards reason and it guides us towards divine law, towards God's law, right? So it guides us to act in reasonable ways uh, in accordance with who we are, in accordance with who other people are. Uh, that's what a well-formed conscience does, and this is one of the ways the Holy Spirit speaks to us within us. Does every human person have a conscience? Yes. Right? Uh, without a doubt, every human person everywhere has a conscience. Some people have extremely poorly formed consciences. You could even just, I mean, there's a term called amoral, like somebody who just doesn't, you know, just bull in a china shop when it comes to moral actions. They're just amoral. They don't, they're not necessarily immoral, they're amoral. They don't have a, a formed conscience at all. Uh, but this is one of the things that comes to us with Christian maturity. As we grow closer to Christ over time, we begin to understand what, what, what it means uh, to be a godly person, to look at others uh, in life and uh, through God's eyes, to look at situations in life through God's eyes. And so this is what we, we uh, are blessed with, is that the Holy Spirit uh, comes to us and, 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 and in whispers helps us to understand how to live godly lives. So the well-formed conscience is one of those ways, uh, and I think that's what's behind it. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 2, if you want to do some bonus reading, uh, but about the difference between uh, righteousness and sin, uh, making moral decisions, making decisions that are in line with what God wants for us. So, so the Holy Spirit has lots and lots of different work. I can't you know, teach a whole class on the Word of the Holy Spirit tonight because we got like 20, 20 minutes anyway. But... That's what Jesus says he points to here as he's introducing this concept of, hey, I promise that the Holy Spirit's going to help you out. Uh, discerning between the values of Christ, godly values, and the values of this world. Jesus uses this great image. I'm sure it's an image that you all talked about in your small groups. It was uh, rather entertaining to hear the uh, group of guys in here talk about this image. I wasn't paying attention until they got my attention. It's like, well, good. What are you doing over there? Uh, it was fun to think about it. So Jesus says, hey, listen, I'm here a little while, I'm gone a little while, and then I'll be back. All right? That's essentially what he says in chapter 16. Uh, and, of course, he's referring to his life, his death, and his resurrection. And he uses this great image of a woman in childbirth. Now, he's not alone in using it. I've got to put up there. Paul also uses this uh, great image. Powerful image. Here's what Jesus says uh, about his going, his coming. He's going away for a while. He's coming back. And he says, this is to your advantage. This is going to be a good thing. This is going to bring you all kinds of joy. That I'm going to go away and then I'm going to come back. But here's what he says. When a woman is in labor, she has pain. Because her hour has come. Now it's interesting that he says her hour has come because we've been reading about Jesus' hour coming over and over and over again throughout John's gospel. Remember, my hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. And he says, my hour is here. So it's, it's not a mistake. Because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. So the first question I have for you guys, and you can just give me a, a yes or no, is, you know, Jesus says that uh, once the child's born, the woman, she doesn't remember the pain. It's just all joy and gladness. Now, do the women in the room agree with that or anything? Do they remember it or not? It was a crying shame. 
crime scene. It is a little crime scene-ish. A lot of uh, blood going over. Uh, I think it's. I think. I think sometimes it's actually. I do think that there uh, sometimes can be this uh, moment, just in my own experience, having uh, gone through uh, uh, three of these myself. Uh, there can be some moments of amnesia along the way. Having observed three of these myself. <laughs> There's such immense joy with the birth of a child, and it's not something you really have to explain to someone. It's not something you have to teach somebody about. It's something that really is like this uh, immense experience. In fact, uh, you know, there's all kinds of work that's done on, in psychological circles on why people smile when they see a baby. Just innately, you don't teach somebody that, right? Like it's just something that happens. Uh, you see a baby, and they've done all these studies of trying to figure out why does this happen. People just innately smile when they see a baby. There's a sense of joy, right? A sense of new life. And part of it is they talk about the facial structure of babies and the grins and the chubbiness and all this. And the way it works uh, psychologically is this very pleasing image for, for an adult human being. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a real communication of joy without teaching. Uh, so we all know that. We all know that uh, children are this uh, great joy. It's a powerful image, but he's doing something even more here than just talking about uh, each, each uh, new life that's formed. And Paul's quote here helps us to see what he's talking about even on a whole nother level. All right. Let me see if I can unpack this for you, and then we'll get on the road. Uh, here's what Paul writes in Romans 8. Romans 8, by the way, if you just want one book of the Bible to meditate on for the rest of your life. Just go read Romans 8, sit in a room. It'll be more than enough theology to keep you occupied for the rest of your life. I promise you that. Here's what he says. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption the redemption of our bodies. So the whole creation is groaning with this labor pain, longing for what? For new life. Longing for new life. And it's what is at the heart of every human being. Every human being is longing for new life. Uh, it's part of the joy that we experience when, when you know, we look down at the little baby that we're holding and and we see the new life. We see the, the life continue. Life goes on. Uh, so every one of us, though, wants this, this new life. And what Jesus is so much getting at here, and what St. Paul is repeating down here, is that what happens when Jesus comes is really a new creation. And I want you to watch for this over the next several chapters especially, because what, what John is doing you'll remember we started with new creation in this study. And John's going to go back to that imagery. So it's just under the surface and it's in the narrative, especially around the death and his description of the resurrection of Jesus. Remember this study started with in the beginning, right? In the beginning. That was a reference to creation. All right? And so here we're seeing that, that what's about to happen What's about to come forth are these labor pains. That's his crucifixion. Uh, and then there's going to be some new life on the other side of that. And that's his resurrection. So this is a powerful image. And it's one that's right at the heart of uh, what's in all of us. Uh, this desire for God uh, to plant within us new life. It's part of the reason that you're here at this Bible study. It's part of the reason you come here week after week and and, uh, and seek solace in the sacraments, which are signs of God's new life uh, that are happening all around us. Uh, we're fed, we're nourished, we're, we grow. 
uh, and we receive that new life, and that new life is renewed over and over again. So the new life happens through the death and resurrection, through the pain and then through the birth. So watch for creation imagery uh, as we get towards uh, chapter 18 and 19 and 20. All right, I'm out of time. I had more to say, but you know, that's the way these things go. Uh, Got to get on the road. So if you'll stand with me, we'll say a prayer. Well, let's say this before we say the prayer. You know, invite somebody who you're sitting in a pew with to come to a Bible study with you over the days of Lent. A lot of times people think, you know, hey, I should give up chocolate, and that's not bad. But uh, maybe one of the things they could do is take on reading, the, reading sort of the heart of the heart of the heart of the Bible. Uh, so over these days of Lent, maybe that's something that they could consider. So invite somebody to come with you. It's not too late. They're not going to miss anything. We're not going to leave them out. Uh, you can go ahead with the chocolate. And you can, you can give up the chocolate, or you can give it over to Bill, one or two. But uh, invite somebody to come with you. Let us pray. Father, thank you uh, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we give you thanks for uh, the fact that you dwell with us and that you're always with us. And you always want to advocate for us and help us. And we pray that we would open our hearts and open our minds and open our ears. Uh, to that reality, uh, that we would be more open uh, each day to the work that you want to do within us. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody.